Our sixth speaker of the day served in key leadership positions from lieutenant to lieutenant general in armor formations across the United States and Europe over the last 35 years. He has operational combat tours in Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce Commanding General, 1st United States Army, Lieutenant General Thomas James. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished participants and maneuverists from the Maneuver Center of Excellence and all those distributed across the world. It's great to be up. I'm Tom James. I'm the commander of 1st U.S. Army. We affectionately call Task Force D. And the gentleman to my right is Command Sergeant Major John McDwyer. He just joined us yesterday. Matter of fact, he signed for his quarters yesterday, and he will serve as Deed 7, and we're excited about having him on our team, and this is his first event as First Army Command Sergeant Major. Uh, but to Major General Pat Donahoe and Command Sergeant Major Celestine, and great seeing you, Chris Budahas. Thank you for inviting us to be able to participate in the Maneuver Warfighting Conference. I think this is the fifth time that I've been able to brief and address uh, the audience over the years, and it's, it's a very special thing to do. But what I'd like to do is start off just by highlighting no place in our Army focuses more on winning at the point of contact than the Maneuver Center of Excellence. And I have a history there. You know, I was the 46th Chief of Armor. I was the first Armor Commandant that spent my entire tour of duty at Fort Benning. Ted Martin was before me, and he pulled the Armor School from Knox into Fort Benning, and we formed the, the Maneuver Center of Excellence. And I work really closely with Walt Pyatt, my counterpart in the infantry school, and as well, General Brown, the Maneuver Center of Excellence commander. But there's three things that I wanted to share with you real quick about Fort Benning, especially for those students that are in the schoolhouse there that I don't want you to miss because they've forever etched memories in me. The first one was taking the last 100 yard walk in the National Infantry Museum. As an armor officer, it hit me hard. Just think of the emotion associated with starting out at Antietam Creek and ending up in Afghanistan and all of those fights in between where infantry fought for our country. Think about it, 70 to 80% of the casualties in our nation's history were infantrymen. It's hallowed ground. The second piece was I was honored to escort Jerry Wickham's wife and his son, Jerry Jr., when we dedicated McGinnis Wickham Hall. Obviously, Ross McGinnis and Jerry Wickham, two Medal of Honor recipients, Vietnam and then the War on Terror. And you think about what they did with their names forever etched in the masonry of that hall of learning. It was extremely special. And then the last memory I had was when I was a 7th ID commander. I went to Fort Benning to watch the internment of Lieutenant General Retired Hal Moore as he was put to rest in the National Museum, uh, correction, the National Cemetery next to his wife at Fort Benning. Oh, by the way, he and Basil Pumley were the first two to make the walk up the last 100 yards. A very special place, a very special place to learn. Now, what I'd like to start off with in our topic today, I got to start off highlighting one big thing up front. We will never win a war or participate in a war without the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve, nor will we be able to handle the global requirements without both COMPO 2 and COMPO 3. It's important to understand that up front as we start to talk about how we build lethality and readiness in those two compos, our teammates there. And I'd like to start by going back to earlier this morning when our boss, General Garrett, talked about, I want to master the fundamentals at platoon and below and when at the point of contact. And he talked about foundational readiness, the idea that you've got to master those fundamentals before you move on along. It's not a... Uh, a, a chain of just you, you do one task and then you move up and up and up. It's multi echelon, but you always stay at that foundational base and maintain those fundamentals in order to win at the point of contact. So the purpose of our pitch today to you is to inform you on what Task Force D First Army is, how we contribute to the, the total force fight, and really the challenges of generating readiness in the Guard and Reserve across people, equipment, readiness of people and equipment, 
training and the resource of time of which you heard from John Jensen earlier today as well. And so you should see my first slide up right now. And it defines us. So if we talk about what is the identity of First Army, there are three pillars. The first one is our history. The second one is our mission. And the third one is our people. And so the history I'll start with. 1918 in Europe, John J. Pershing formed the first field army in the Army of the United States. And the formation fought through World War I and into World War II. And so that was how, that was a, it was an army war fighting headquarters. It was under Omar Bradley, the first army commanded all ground and airborne forces on the Normandy invasion, as you see on the D-Day picture there with the Higgins boat. And then after World War II, we transitioned into our current role, which is preparing soldiers, active guard and reserve to deploy, fight and win in Korea and Vietnam. And then you see on the picture Desert Storm, where we mobilized roughly 43,000 soldiers into Desert Storm, which is our current mission today. And then beside the Desert Storm picture, upper right corner, you can see the 30th ABCT, which is currently over at OSS. The old Hickory Brigade is we mobilized them from Fort Bliss and deployed them over, and they'll return home here shortly. And then you see the 34th ECAB flying over the embassy in Baghdad during the flare up with Iran not too long ago. And then you can see all of the associated training below that that we accomplished. And so it's it's real important to understand that as we think about readiness and delivering lethality and world-class leaders, that really nests with this mastering the fundamentals and winning at the point of contact. The second piece I wanted to highlight is our mission. Our mission, we have roughly 7,500 soldiers and civilians. Half of those are assigned under Title 11, half are DS to us from the Army Reserve Support Command, spread all over the country and the territories, the 54 as we refer to it, getting after it and enabling our partners in the Army Guard and Reserve to generate readiness to prepare to deploy, fight, and win, and come home. Whether it be a steady state GIFMAT related requirement or whether it be a large scale mobilization operation. And I take you back to John J. Pershing in the lower left there. In 1918, he said, it's not about the active, the guard or the reserve. It's about preparing the American citizen for the duties of war. So he defined total force policy back in 1918, which really defines our role as an extension of Forcecom today. And the last piece I wanted to highlight is our people. And we talk about people in our formation it is soldiers, DA civilians, and family members, all components. We have active guard and reserve and task force need first army. And so we are who we train. And so I understand that I've got you right now in about the middle of the afternoon, you've had lunch. So as we transition into a couple slides, I wanna wake you up with a little lethality video. Let's go ahead. <laughs> All right, so our agenda. We're gonna start off by really defining the challenge, our problem statement in the form of a question. Then we'll talk about mastering the fundamentals. It rolls off the tongue, but what does mastering mean and what are those fundamentals that we are talking about? And then how does it relate to the Army National Guard and Army Reserve as we look at their prepare year templates over time? Because we have the, the biggest resource we have to manage with our, our compo two and three teammates is time, as you heard from John Jensen's pitch. And then talk, I'm gonna give you an example of winning at the point of contact. And then we're gonna talk about a few key takeaways and then we'll, we'll have some question time. But one other thing I wanna point out on this chart, as you can see inlaid on there, is soldiers deploying onto the beaches of Normandy and the Normandy invasion. And I think it's really important to highlight that the two divisions that occupied the ground first were the 1st Infantry Division Active Component and the 29th Infantry Division Army National Guard out of Virginia. So it was a combined force, a total force going in 
on that assault. And so we got to ask ourselves constantly, no matter what vehicle you're taking or aircraft you're in, when we drop that ramp of the Higgins boat, are we ready to win at the point of contact? Next chart, please. And so this is the problem statement as we see it. Task Force D, First Army, enables the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve to master the fundamentals at squad and platoon level to enable the lethality required to win at the point of contact, given the unique resource requirements. I think that's very important to understand, and we've talked about it in a couple of the briefings leading up to this. The idea that when we talk about mastering the fundamentals, it's about generating readiness in terms of people, equipment, maintaining both people and equipment, and then managing that precious time to align the associated resources to enable us to generate readiness and be able to win at the point of contact during that resource challenge. We have a construct in First Army that we share with our partners and the enterprise that say that we exist to look deep, to prioritize, to resource, and to empower, and to empower our formations to be able to get after it, but we have to line up those resources uh, to be effective. And so next chart. And so if we go to this, we wrestled in a command conference, a multi uh commanders conference, what does mastering the fundamentals mean? And it's relatively a simple definition there out of ADP 7.0. It's really soldiers and units that can perform tasks to standard repeatedly, increasing, increasing the challengingness of that, the stressfulness, varying conditions, day, night, NBC environment, whatever it may be, but that is mastery. And there is a challenge, as, as I talked to you about, if time is a finite resource, and we have to develop a path to mastery for our Guard and Reserve teammates. And oh, by the way, you heard General Anderson talking about the things that pulled the National Guard away in a Title 32 status, COVID, wildfires, hurricanes, and you name it in the 32, that disrupts a training path that requires PME and also individual and collective training. And so we have to fight through that. So first off, we have to define the fundamentals. What are those? And we define those as those high payoff individual, crew, team, and squad level warrior tasks and battle drills that support those small units supporting collective tasks, as well as the mission essential tasks at the company level. And so if we can master those, if we talk in terms of acting on contact, return fire, deploy, report, develop the situation, if we can return fire, deploy, and report, then it allows our small unit leaders and then at Echelon to develop the situation. And so as we looked at mastering and the fundamentals, we said, what are the three components that we really got to get after to be able to get after those fundamentals? And we came up with three. The first one is you have to be able to act on contact, and then you have to be able to master your weapon system meaning you destroy what you shoot at, you kill what you shoot at. And the third thing is you have to, in small unit level, maneuver to a position of advantage where you can gain, exploit, and maintain the initiative. And so how do we structure training at the individual small unit collective and collective level to be able to master those things? And I hearken back, and you see in the yellow block, I remember back to LTP when I was a Brigade S3 in 2nd Brigade 3rd Infantry Division. We were out at LTP and General Thurman was talking to us in our, our initial introduction. And he said that platoons exist to kill what they shoot at, to act on contact, to breach or bypass obstacles, and to report effectively. That is essentially it. It rolls off the tongue, but it requires repetition and varying conditions and intensity to be able to master. And then he talked at the company team level about all of those still apply, but you have to maintain also freedom of maneuver at the company team level. And so with defining the mastering the fundamentals, the next chart, I wanna highlight a couple of things that we look at when we talk in terms of Army National Guard, and then we'll talk about Army Reserves in the follow on slide. I think it's important to understand with the Guard that they're organized, designed, generally like the active component. As you heard from General Jensen's pitch earlier, you know, there are eight divisions, there are 27 brigades, and there are eight cabs and eight field artillery brigades in the National Guard. And uh, 
under General Hokanson and now General Jensen, they've come up with a, a new construct where they align brigades under divisions for training. So division alignment for training is the concept they, that they have developed. And it works really well because it's loosely kind of constructed like an active component division. But what you're able to do is monitor and commander to commander dialogue and use unit training management to be able to manage and align those resources most effectively. People being a huge part that we'll talk about here in a second. But that's a key component of it. So now you know generally how it's organized. You can see prepare years on the top part of this chart. That's the reserve component unit readiness cycle. I call it readiness cycle templates. And it generally defines a five-year cycle to ready a unit within the National Guard. Prepare year one shows the key things that we focus on for a unit that's starting in that five-year cycle. It's individual and staff training, and it's generally about 39 days in a year specifically focused on those individual tasks and things that you can do in the battle assembly a couple of days a month and then in your AT period in that first year. The second year, we start to ramp up a bit squad and platoon training, as you see there, while still maintaining that foundation with the crew and individual and uh, staff themes. And then prepare year three, we participate in a, as, as a brigade organization or a battalion, depending on how that organization is designed, within a warfighter, whether it be a higher echelon division core warfighter where it's a down trace brigade or just a brigade level warfighter that MCTP covers down on. I think that's gonna change in the future where we're only gonna do brigades nested with divisions and corps. And you've got an XCTC, which is an exportable co combat training center package. That is a prepare year three collective training event where we really wanna to try to get at Echelon at the troop leading procedures at battery, battery company and troop level and about all of those associated tasks at battalion, squadron and brigade level related to the ops process, MDMP and synchronizing the war fighting functions. So it's multi echelon training at the XCTC, but the focus is still on mastering the fundamentals at platoon and below. And then you go into prepare year four, and if you're a brigade that's designated to go to a combat training center, the eyes typically go to the JRTC, the ACE NTC, but we've got eyes going out to the NTC as well. And so those units will do that and prepare year four. And, and you can see, I, one thing I didn't highlight, prepare year three, we up to 48 days a year, and then 54 and prepare year four. That is what's resource template. But as you heard General Anderson talk about his pitch a couple before me, he said that that gets up into the hundreds. Sometimes it can be 120, 185 to 120 days, depending on the, the level that we put those leaders through in the collective training cycles to get them ready. And then in the ready year, we just sustain that. Or if it's a unit that's designated on the gift map to deploy, we mobilize them either at North Fort Hood or at Fort, Fort Bliss, Texas, and then we increase their readiness level to the theater required readiness level and then deploy them into the theater to, to deploy, fight, win, and come home. So that is a general description of a prepare year, five, five year cycle for the National Guard. Now what I'd like to do is go down to the bottom left and talk a little bit about the challenges. First off, the challenge is number of days. It's time, if you talk about 39 days per year, even if we up that a number of days and some of the other and additional prepare years, that's possible, but we also have the associated friction of, uh, of uh, hurricanes, wildfires, and the things we talked about. And so, so we gotta keep an eye on that. We have our brigades that partner across the entire National Guard formation. As I described, about 7,500 uh, soldiers and civilians across the country tentacled in to our Guard and Reserve partners to enable them in pre-mobilization in those prepare years to plan for training, to align resources for training, and help participate when we can within that training. Obviously, resources being finite, we have to prioritize how we allocate our resources to enable our teammates to build readiness and prepare for mobilization. The, the next piece is PME and functional schools have to occur too. That also draws some of the leaders away from those uh, battle assemblies and ATs and some of that collective training. That has to be planned out appropriately 
uh, so that we don't lose some of the readiness and lose some of the training, collective training opportunities as much as possible. And then obviously if you do the math there, the minimal amount of reps under varying conditions we can do. In some of those earlier prepare years, we like to leverage simulation uh, to be able to, to get the reps and vary the conditions and increase the intensity. And, and we work through that in those prepare years to help get ready and set conditions for those collective training events when we execute them. The bottom right is what we define as the path to mastery. And I know if I was somebody listening to me pitch and laying out the time constraints and resource issues, can we actually get to mastery? And that's a fair question given COVID and some of the other things that we have to deal with. And what General Garrett, Forcecom, and the CTCs have come up with uh, and, and briefing obviously the chief of staff of the army is these purpose-driven CTC rotations. So we have decision points that allow us to modify those CTCs based on the readiness level or the entry level of a brigade going to a CTC, or in some cases a battalion supporting an active uh, duty CTC rotation. And so we work through that in detail. They even have an idea, a concept, excuse me, called expeditionary RSOI where we can do some of the crew qualifications and even platoon qualifications as required at a CTC so that we maximize the live fire at the end of the rotation. So we're thinking through that as we work to mastery. But if I take the top one, it's all about training management, using the operations process and doing a baseline assessment of a unit, understanding their current state across PSR and T, and then visualizing a future state requirement. Right now, it's very clear, it's T3 C3, by the end of that, prepare year four before they mobilize, because that's what the Guard and Reserve are actually resourced to do. And so General Garrett's guidance lays very nicely on the resourcing in a perfect world for us. It's disruptive a bit in some of the Title 32 things that may pull the Army Guard away and some of the things with COVID that have pulled the Army Reserve away from. And so we, we lay that out. We make sure we identify the resources required so that they nest and that it's multi-echelon. And so the, the third bullet there is individual crew gunnery. We got to master that. We got to be able to kill what we shoot at. We got to be able to maneuver to position of advantage. But shooting is critical no matter what the weapon system, whether it be individual, crew serve, or a vehicle platform. And then the next one is collective training at platoon and below. And that's running those fixed lanes where we can in the earlier prepare years, but really maximizing that time at an XCTC. And in addition to that, if it's a CTC rotation, and if it's not, then we got to have some sort of sustainment function or sustainment activity in that uh, PY year four to maintain that readiness level. And then the last bullet under there is this multi echelon mission command training that we're talking about, where as we focus on platoon and below, we still have to also focus on troop leading procedures at the company battery and troop. And we've got to work on the ops process, MDMP, and synchronizing the war fighting functions at battalion, squadron, and brigade. And in the National Guard, some cases, divisions as they go through a war fighter cycle or a culminating training event to go to OSS. And the bottom line with this is the Force Comm Commander's goal is T3 at M day, at mobilization day, if they're on a mobilization cycle and that's platoon proficiency and below with the ability to up that in post-mobilization. Okay, let's go to the Army Reserve. So the Army Reserve is a little bit different as far as its organization goes. If you think about it, we have logistics, engineers, medical, civil affairs, supporting organizations, functional organizations that enable the big army, the total force. And so it's a little bit different focused exercises in their prepare years. It's still a five-year model. It still starts with individual, some functional, and some staff training in prepare year one. And then you go to two, which is individual, crew, section, and functional training continues. And then prepare year three is collective. And that's where we do our war axes, which are platoon and below. Our log axis, which focuses on that specific function, depending on what it is. And then C sticks or in prepare year four, which is the larger collective activity that's done by the 84th Training Command, supplemented by Task Force D, First Army. And we focus on the collective activities. And in some cases, they're functional exercises 
if as it relates to a sustainment organization or an engineer organization, or for example, a medical organization. And so we work through those in the prepare years, and then we sustain them or deploy them in the prepare year four or five, excuse me, as we continue in the cycle. Now, if you go down to the, the challenges of the Army Reserve, I've already talked to some that are very similar in the National Guard. You know, the time available uh, to train, I think the numbers for resource for the reserve are 39 days and prepare years one and two, and it's 45 and prepare years three and four. And then those can be up depending on the situation and mission, but the baseline template, their resource for those numbers of days per year. Given the idea that was, was talked about earlier with General Anderson about they have to balance employers, families, and their service to our military. And we got to be cognizant of that and understand and appreciate those realities. And so the next piece relates, they still have the same issue with drills uh, impacted by PME and schools. They still have to go to schools and we still have to figure out the best fit in time. And sometimes it's disrupted, but we got to do it to get the leaders to school. And then there's also a reduced number of days time to focus on these mastering the fundamentals at different uh, different iterations at different and varying levels and changing it up. But the, the last thing I wanted to highlight on challenges for the reserve is they have a challenge of manning at the mid-grade officer and NCO level, just as far as recruiting and being able to pull those, those soldiers in and keeping them in that sweet spot, which is critical when we talk about mastering the fundamentals at platoon and below. Another challenge for the reserve is their headquarters have to be where the recruiting space is, where people want to serve. And so they have to uniquely put their headquarters in certain locations, and then the downtrace companies of those organizations or subordinate units could be all over the country. So just hypothetically, you could have a, a headquarters in New York that has a company in California. So that makes it relatively hard, especially during drill weekends, to be able to connect and do the things you want to do to build that mastery and that unit cohesion. And so the reserve worked really hard with that and we help as best we can because we have units that partner with them all over the country as well uh, to help kind of pull that together. A another thing that General Daniels will tell you, the commander of the Army Reserve, is that we got to continue to recruit those soldiers that decide to leave the active component to come over to the Army Reserve and fill those critical leadership positions and they can continue to lead and do what they did in the active in a part-time role. Something to consider, especially as you connect with those uh, that serve under you out there. And then the path to mastery is very similar. We have the time constraints that still focus on people, equipment, the readiness of those two, getting the right leaders in the right place, and then maximizing those collective training events at Echelon. Still focusing on the platoon and below, whether it be a functional organization, or like in the Guard, it's a war fighting organization. They're all war fighting, but designed as a BCT or designed as a sustainment brigade or whatever medical unit it might be. And so we also work the multi-echelon system within the Army Reserve as well, focusing on the ops process and, and synchronizing the war fighting functions, working the troop leading procedures at the company level as well uh, during those collective events and some of the the uh, drill weekends and periods, and leveraging simulation to be able to do that. Next chart. And so our next and chart, I want to show you an example. An Army Sergeant Leanne Hester was serving as an MP in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Sergeant Hester and her MP squad were assigned to shadow a convoy of trucks traveling down a supply route when suddenly a group of insurgents attacked the convoy. Under heavy fire, Sergeant Hester and her team moved quickly to put themselves between the convoy and the insurgents. Then, they strategically moved to flank the enemy and cut off their escape route. After that, they engaged the remaining insurgents on foot. The dust finally settled after a 25-minute firefight. Sergeant Hester and her team eliminated 27 insurgents and secured the convoy, while only three members from the convoy were injured. And on June 16th that same year, Sergeant Leanne Hester was awarded the Silver Star for her gallantry during the attack. So just one, a couple of quick things about winning at the point of contact. We were looking at ex examples that we could use to show you, and Leanne Hester jumped out really quick to us. 
Uh, for those of you that might not know, she was the first female recipient of the Silver Star since World War II, and she was the only one to receive the Silver Star at that point in time in contact, direct fire contact with the enemy. And so she's a special young lady, and she was 22 years old at the time from the Kentucky Army National Guard, and she was the vehicle commander of 4-2 Bravo, Raven 4-2 Bravo, 617 MP Company, 503rd MP Battalion Airborne, and the 18th MP Brigade, and they were doing a route security slash combat logistics patrol security mission when they were ambushed by a significant force. And she was able to shoot what she aimed at and kill it, destroy it. She was able to master her weapon systems, whether it be her vehicle-mounted weapon systems or personal weapon systems, and she was able to maneuver to a position of advantage, and she acted effectively on contact. The end result of that fight with her leadership and others with her, 27 extremists killed and six wounded. So this is just a good example of she had mastered the fundamentals. That organization had mastered them at the platoon and below and were able to apply them effectively to accomplish their mission. If I could go to the, to the next chart, and I believe it's my wrap-up chart, it's key takeaways. And I want to highlight a, a few things here, and then I want to hand off to Star Major. As we've looked at this, and you can see the three blocks across the chart at the top, when we talk about building unit readiness, readiness to win at the point of contact, we're talking about man, equip, and then align all the resources to effectively train that organization to master the fundamentals that platoon and below, prepare to increase that in post-mobilization, if mobilizing, and then be able to train at echelon to get after those uh, ops process tasks that we talked about earlier. So that's a key component of that. And we have to really master training management and look numbers of years out. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned when I first took over First Army is I could not look at this problem through an active component bias. When you say, well, that's a year out, that's not a lot of time for our guard or reserve unit. And so we have to be able to align those resources to maximize that time and be able to multi-echelon train while focusing on platoon and below. And so then we talked about the fundamentals. They got to be able to destroy what they shoot at. They got to be able to act on contact. And they got to be able to maneuver to a position of advantage, a combination of movement and fires, just like Sergeant Escobar. Sergeant Lee. So, sir, thank you. Uh, not new to First Army. I've been the Division Sergeant Major for Division West at Fort Hood for two years. So these are some observations from CTC rotations, mobilizations, XCTCs, and CTXs that I've observed for our very successful Compo 2 and 3 company team and batteries that have been very successful. There's three key takeaways. One is educated leaders. Leaders made the hard choice to make sure that their junior leaders, both officer and enlisted, had time to go to the PME. They would send in the PME instead of uh, AT, or maybe even a CTC or, CT, or uh, XCTC, because they got better, more educated leaders out of there. And it also helped them with one of their key uh, areas that they're concerned with is retention. If you take care of the soldier, send him to school, get him what he needs to get promoted, he's going to stay with the organization, be more positive, and he's going to contribute even more. Uh, same thing with functional courses, especially long ones. Master gunners in the regular Army are something that everybody is trying to produce. Well, the reserve components have the same problem of trying to get them and then get them into school because it is so long. The units that took care of their soldiers and got them to those schools had better training, better training management on the back end, which leads me into another one, training management. The time that they have, the Compo 2 and 3 have to train is so minuscule that they must not waste any time at their, at their drills. They need to find uh, creative ways to get everything in uh, to do what they need to do. They need to prioritize their training, and these units did, uh, picking tasks at the individual and crew squad level that can pay off the biggest bucks and also integrate multi-echelon training in there so the staffs or the company or battalion level leadership were getting some training there. And the other thing that really made them successful is when they were out on lane training, if a platoon squad or crew was not doing uh, actively engaged in that lane, if there was very well resource 
and rehearse training available. So they just didn't pull out lawn chairs and sit around and BS, but they were doing training and making sure that they were doing something every minute of every day that they could. And the last thing that these leaders did was something that was very, very done very well in the, the old days, I'll say, of the uh, Compo 2 and 3, but it was having stabilized cruise platoons and uh, squads. That has not been with the turnover that they've had because of op tempo. Um, that's become problematic for the Compo 2 and 3 units as it has for uh, Compo 1. But the units that were very successful, their leaders were very invested in keeping those units together uh, so that they could build upon their training. They wouldn't have to train all the time um, at the basics. They could go back, reinforce them, but then they can continue moving on up towards collective training. So involved leaders through all the prepare phases got units to be very successful as they went on their road to deployment. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. You appreciate it. Next chart. And Chris, that completes our pitch. Over to you for questions. Sir, thank you very much. How do you read this station? I've got you clear, buddy. All right, sir. Hey, sir, our first question from the field is the following. Sir, it's our major. Is Compo 2 and 3 infrastructure adequately, or is it being outpaced at this time in preparation for units to prepare themselves for large-scale combat operations? If it is being outpaced, how are we closing the gap? Thanks, Chris, I, 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 and thanks for that question, whoever gave it. I, I think you'll see that the leadership of the Guard and Reserve are doing the best they can with resources available to keep things current, as current as they can for the, the training things they need that are related to the active component to enable training to occur. I, I think that it's slower. I mean, it's just, just is, uh, just based on number of resources. And, and the spread and so putting the right place at peak, uh, the right systems in the right places to be able to cover it. I think that's important. I think you'll see that, uh, at, that for the most part, we're doing okay. We still have room to grow in that area. Any, anything on that sort of major, you were a cat team with, with how we use no, resources. No, the, the, the guard is being, the garden reserves are being re, uh, resourced a lot better uh, than when I first came into the job two years ago. Uh, they do, as we were talking earlier um, on a couple other uh, presenters, they do use training devices and training as a service very well to get after the training uh, and help with their time resources. Um, and as the C evolves, uh, one of the uh, things that Division West is uh, leading the charge on is how to get training devices and uh, the new technology to help the Guard and Reserve train um, remotely and to help with their uh, time management. If I could add one thing to that as well. Uh, several of our Guard units are nicely located near active component posts. And so I'll give you a good example of the third ID. I mean, they've got the Red Cloud Range Complex, NPRC, uh, through site video, all of those kinds of things that our guard partners can be able to leverage to do and reserve as well, depending on the location. So there are certain spots where if we do the training management appropriately, we can kind of piggyback off of active component systems as far as uh, simulation and training goes. Sir, our next question for you in the command star major with the focus on the with the focus of the fundamentals on this squad at the squad and platoon level, how is the reserve component uh, growing future company commanders, first sergeants, battalion brigade commanders, and command sergeants majors. So it, it's interesting because you focus on platoon and below doesn't mean that you ignore the company battery and troop echelon. And so, you know, obviously platoon sergeants become first sergeants, platoon leaders become company commanders, XOs, et cetera, et cetera. And so it actually builds on itself but because we're focused at platoon and below does not mean that we ignore that echelon. We still focus on company battery and troop, troop leading procedures and the things that you need to do, especially the leading functions that you need to do at that echelon to be able to enable those platoons to be able to get after it. So I don't see that being a void. I just see that just based on the parties and where we're resourced, 
we have to focus platoon and below to make sure we can build that foundation to enable the decision-making process at the company battery and troop level. And so I, that still exists and we still focus on it with our, our partner teammates in both compos. Anything on that, sir? Uh, no, sir, you said it right. Well, one of the things I did want to highlight also is when we talk about the reserve, there is that void that is of concern. Uh, the the mid-grade officers and non-commissioned officers. And so figuring out how to do that is a, a challenge for us. Give an example at a, a, a C sticks that I was at at Port McCoy, uh, Wisconsin. The, the platoon leader for a petroleum company ended up serving as the company commander because there wasn't one. And so that you just got to keep recruiting and trying to find those leaders to do it. But there's a lieutenant that we're developing and a formation that we were, we're going to take advantage of that opportunity. We just got to get the right people in the right place. And so we continue to work that. I hope that I'm ready for a re-attack on that if we didn't answer the question. All right, sir. So I'm going to go to our next question. We'll see if we'll get a re-attack on it. Um, so the next question, which uh, General Garrett and then uh, you and the Command Sergeant Major alluded to, is uh, we heard the challenges uh, with both uh, all across all compotes with developing training plans, synchronizing uh, training plans and coordinating them appropriately. Um, as you take a look at compo two and three, what are some of the challenges with uh, resource lock-in in are the compo two and three uh, organizations getting the right amount of resources to be effective? So very good question. And when I think about uh, training plans for Compo 2 and 3, I, I think we do a really a good job of, of assessing early and then building a training plan. The idea is how do you manage those resources and align them appropriately to be most effective? And so the coordination is, is key. So our brigades in that pre-mobilization partnership, we are connected and, and with those units and we help them build their training plan. And oh, by the way, we look at the problem 24-7, 365 for them. And so in periodic touch points, we help them shape that and align resources. And so for the most part, I, I believe we got the right resources. Now, having said that, there is a finite amount of resources. And so from a First Army perspective, we have to prioritize operationally how we do business. And we have an operational priority list, and I'm, I'll share that with you because I think it's illustrative. The first priority for us are units that are mobilizing, that are in the mobilization pipeline, preparing down at Bliss and Hood to deploy, fight, and win, and come home. The second one are those units designated through a notice of sourcing, NOST, to be a future mobilizer. And so we focus on those units. And then the third one is a collective training event coming up. Like, for example, just use a guard brigade that's going into an XCTC in preparation for an NTC rotation or JRTC rotation the next year. We put a lot of party and focus on developing those leaders, reps at MDMP, those kinds of things. And then the fourth priority is our partnering. Units that may not be in those cycles yet, but we want to reach out and touch to at least help them shape a training program before they fall into one of the categories above. Sir and Command Sergeant Major, thank you for so very much for your presentation. Sir, I'd like to give you an opportunity for final comments. Yes, thanks. And I, I appreciate it, Chris. And, and really appreciate the opportunity. We watched all of the pitches today and appreciate all that the Maneuver Center is doing to pull this together, especially given these unique times. And I do have just one more slide I wanted to go to. And, and it's really just to educate the force. You know, AIM cycles are coming up and we're always recruiting in Task Force D First Army. And just a couple of facts that people may not know. We are the largest OCT organization in the United States Army. You know, you've got our CTCs out there getting after it, but we're spread all over the country doing OCT duties. And so it's a unique and challenging opportunity. Now I've got a Maneuver Captain's Career Course audience out there probably today. And we don't want you to come to us right away out of the MCCC. We want you to go to your unit and, and get your experience as a company battery troop commander or whatever it may be. But then if you want to stabilize in a post like Stuart, Hood, Bliss, or JBLM, come see us. And we can, keep, we can stabilize your family, keep you relevant, allow you to continue to focus on war fighting and help the total Army. And with that, we're prepared to talk to anybody that wants to reach out to us or people that you may know 
uh, that's in that cycle that it makes sense for them to come to First Army, we'd love to have them. And with that, Chris, thank you very much. It's an honor to talk to you today. Sir, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Command Sergeant Major. Uh, for the group, a reminder, you have to back out of this session and then click on the next uh, hot button uh, to uh, enter into uh, General Camera's presentation. Yeah. Um, when were we supposed to be done?